Well, John, I wrote something down the top of my notes here. I've only got four pages of notes today. The sermon I preached last week in Kokomo had 18 pages. <laughs> but I wrote up here at the top, I usually don't give too many disclaimers about what I'm talking about, but today I'm going to do something that's a suicide for a speaker. And that's I'm going to read a lot, and I'm going to tell some personal experiences. So I want you to listen really close. And I'm going to, there's something I'm going to repeat over and over again. And if you think this is me tooting my own horn and Sandra, you're missing the point totally. Listen closely. It seems that the one common denominator that is missing in our churches today, it's not knowledge. A lot of smart people, you got a lot of smart people in this church about their personal lives and everything and about religion or the Bible, however you want to term it. But the one thing that's missing so much in our churches is a simple little word, love. Now maybe it's not missing in this church. And some of you are probably saying, oh no, here we go again. Because this is what I keep talking about a lot now. I'm beating the same drum today that I beat the last time I was here. And yes, there is a reason why Jesus hasn't come yet. And it's not because there haven't been enough tornadoes and volcanoes and tsunamis and police killings and all of that. That's not the reason. Because if you'll read in your Bible, it'll name off all of these things that shows the end of time is coming. But last time I was here, I told you what those little last words were that people just don't talk about in that verse. And that is the fact that it says, but the end is not yet. Used to go fishing a lot with a fellow, his name was George. It really was, it's, I'm not making that up. Quite a bit older than me, but he was a Bible student. He just studied the Bible and studied the Bible, and he just wanted to share his faith with everybody. And I went, one morning I went over to his house, we were going to go fishing. And when I walked in his house, he was just pacing the floor, pacing the floor. And I said, well, are you ready to go? And he wouldn't even hardly talk to me, he was just pacing the floor. I could tell he was really upset. And finally I says, George, what is going on in your mind today? <laughs> he said, well, I'll tell you what it is. He says, I took the Sabbath to my neighbor over here and he threw me out. I said, did you hear what you just said? I took him the Sabbath. <laughs> He stopped and he said, you know, I think you hit on something here. <laughs> yes. Okay, that's something to think about. I'm talking about people who have passed away now, so I hope you don't bother me. I hope it don't bother you. But I used to know a fellow about 91 years old, and he was a former literature evangelist, call porter, whatever you're going to call him. And we were talking about going around and witnessing and sharing our faith and, you know, and having baptisms and all of these things like this. And he says, you know what? He says, all the years I've been out meeting people and selling books and talking to them and everything, he says, I have not seen one person come to the Lord because of me. I said, well, 
What are you going to do about it? What, what did you do about it? He said, well, I got so discouraged, I just didn't do anything about it, so I just quit doing anything. Now, I want you to keep these two stories in mind as we, as we go along today. Love. It's a big word. It's a big word. A new commandment I give to you is found in John 13, verses 34 and 35. If you want to look that up in your Bible, mark it. Make sure you know this verse. John 13, verses 34 and 35. And you wonder why God says, I give you a new commandment. Why was it new? It was new because he hadn't been doing it. And he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I ran across an editorial. This is one of my long readings. I'm going to read it to you. It's called What If. And I wrote down at the top of this that this doesn't put a lump in your throat. You better, you better take a long, hard look at yourself. This was written back August 28th of 2017. And the, is when we were having an eclipse. So just listen. What if? And for a few moments, the world was looking up at one of God's amazing creations. The eclipse. No one was creating havoc. No one was entertaining fake news. No one was tearing down or raising a ruckus. No one was being mean. Can you imagine a world like that? They were, they were all looking up. They had a new focus, a new perspective, and the world was smiling. If, <laughs> if only for a few moments, it says here. <laughs> they were smiling. It felt good, really good. Eclipse glasses were shared by those who had them, even with strangers. Everyone wanted to see the light in the darkness. Social media was filled with pictures of people smiling and laughing. It didn't matter that so many of the pictures looked the same. Everyone wanted to share their experiences with the world, and the world smiled. I wish we had more moments like those. Now here, here go some what ifs. What if the world would look up with a new perspective? What if the world did not look out through dark and distorted glasses? What if the world didn't look for something? <laughs> I can't read this without laughing. What if the world didn't look for something to complain about? Disagree with or be just plain mean? Just plain mean. The words of the world were not, what if the wor words of the world were not seasoned with sarcasm and bitterness? I see the world judging others, not as they would want to be judged, but as if they, the world is judge, jury, and executioner 
if you dare to disagree with them. I don't understand it, and I never will. Now listen to this. <laughs> I, I, this really got me. When absurdity meets stupidity, no one wins. Boy. When a newscaster can't even broadcast a game because his name is offensive to someone, I shake my head. Hate cannot be physically torn down, nor can ugliness of history be eroded. Nothing can change a heart that does not want to change. And it's sad, very sad. I was raised to treat everyone the same way, just as I wanted to be treated with respect and kindness. It's not rocket science. Now we are bombarded daily with angry grievances. We see people protesting who just seem to be crossways with anything they don't agree with, and they cannot be reasoned with in any way, shape, or form. Everyone is so loud with their thoughts, no one is listening. No, it does not matter what is said, someone will disagree with it. And I shouldn't even say this, but I jot it down here and I'm going to say it. And then you can call the conference president and complain about it if you want to. But nothing gets under my skin any more than to go to our conference uh, stations when they're electing new officers and stuff and they have the microphone sitting out on the floor out here and there's a line of about 50 people lined up to talk in that microphone and they say the dumbest stupidest things I've ever heard in my life why wouldn't you disagree with them they don't make sense I better get off my soapbox here Everyone is so loud with their thoughts, no one is listening. It does not matter what is said, someone will disagree with it. They will put their spin on it, they will wrap it in negativity and put a bow on it. And there you go, they say, deal with it. I hurt for my grandchildren. How can we stop all the negativity? How can the voices be softened? Opinions are no longer shared, but thrown as weapons of destructions. They tear down relationships, they destroy all matter all manner of civility and peace. And the sad part is, we all lose in the end. Then this author goes on and says, well, <laughs> I guess I beat him to it. Well, I'll get off my soapbox before someone tries to tear me down. I fear offending anyone. I fear hurting anyone. I fear criticism. I fear that the comfort and peace of the world that I grew up in is lost and cannot be found. I just know that I will still treat people with kindness even if they do not return the kindness. I will speak my opinions, but with a soft voice. I will look at everyone as though they have a sign around their neck. Now listen to this. I will look at everyone as though they have a sign around their neck that says, please handle me with care. You don't know my story. So for a few minutes, the world dealt with a bit of light in the darkness, and everyone smiled. Why? Because for a few minutes, their focus changed. They looked toward the light, and it was good. I just wish the world would spend more time looking at things with a different perspective. I just know that gratitude, acceptance, kindness, and looking at things from the perspective of others goes a long way in a dark, sometimes hurtful world. I'm just asking, what if? When I read this for the first time, my mind turned to Revelations 2, if you want to turn there.
Revelations 2 and uh, verses 1 through 5. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I'm reading from a, a modern translation. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have, an exa you have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting, but I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen from your first love. Turn back to me again and work as you did at first. If you don't, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Lost your first love. Have you done that? Reading on. This is found in the Tsar of Ages, one of my favorite books. Uh, page uh, 634. Had the Church of Christ had the Church of Christ done her appointed word as the Lord ordained, the whole world would before this have been warned, and the Lord Jesus would have come to our earth in power and great glory. If the church would have done its work before this, what work is that? And also going on, it says, few. Oh, boy, this, this startled me when I read this. And I've read it many times. Few believe with heart and soul that we have a hell to shun and a heaven to win. Few believe that. And also in the Desire of Ages, this is one that I've been questioned on, but I didn't write this book. <laughs> it's Desire of Ages. I didn't write it. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Christ illustrates the nature of true religion. That's where my sermon title came from today. He shows that it consists not, now listen to this. This isn't being <laughs> whatever you want to call it, but Christ illustrates the nature of true religion. He shows that it consists not in systems and creeds or rites, but in the performance of loving deeds, in bringing the greatest good to others, in genuine goodness. That's true religion. As you probably noticed already, sometimes I get very blunt and to the point. My father taught me not to stick my head in the sand and pretend things don't happen. But so many times we think by this will all people know that I am a disciple of God if I keep the commandments the way you think I should. Did you hear what I said? By this, everyone will know that I'm a disciple of Christ if I dress up on Saturday morning and take my Bible and leave and wave my Bible around and everybody knows I'm going to church. Everyone will think I'm a disciple of Christ if I read the Bible through at least once a year and if I hold prestigious offices in the church and if I give lots of money to the church and if I send my children to SDA schools you get the picture, don't you? And would you believe, and I didn't even have this in my notes, but it happened just recently, so help me, I'm not telling you a story, that someone in another church told me that I cannot go to heaven if I'm not vegan.
And I, I just, boy, when things like that come out, uh, I can't keep my mouth closed, John. I said, well, boy, I am really, really devastated. And they said, why? And I said, because Jesus, I want to see Jesus when I go to heaven. He won't be there. Because Jesus ate fish, he ate lamb, and he ate beef. So he won't be there. And it was my privilege a few years ago, several years ago now, to sit on the front porch of Elmshaven, where Ellen White used to live, and talk to her granddaughter and grandson, well, grandson by marriage, granddaughter's husband. Spent about two hours with it, just me and them. And I'm not going to tell you about Ellen White, what she ate and what she didn't eat. I'm not going to tell you that. But let's not make stupid statements like that. Well, am I tooting my own horn? No, not at all. Words of a song. If you could see what I once was, if you could go with me back where I started from, then I know you would see the miracle of love that took me in to its sweet embrace and made me what I am today. A sinner saved by grace. How could I boast of anything I've ever seen or done? How could I dare to claim as mine the victories God has won? Where would I be had God not brought me gently to this place? I'm here to say I'm nothing. Nothing but a sinner saved by grace. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. When I stood condemned to death, he took my place. Now I grow and breathe in freedom with each breath of life I take. I'm loved and forgiven. I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. I'm going to get a little personal here now. <laughs> you know, sometimes when we go to some church or something, I, you know, we've traveled for, well, we don't travel anymore. We're too old and decrepit. But uh, <laughs> I guess we traveled down here this morning, but that's a chore. <laughs> But you know, we've been to some churches that you just about have to chip the ice off the front door to get in. I'm, 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 I mean that. Where has the love gone? We sang in a church. I'm not going to tell you where it's at. And it's here in Indiana, I'll tell you that much. And after we finished singing, two ladies came up. And said, boy, you're, that song you sang was for us. <laughs> oh, really? Well, good. I'm glad it blessed you. Well, you see, last Thursday, this is on a Sabbath, and they said, last Thursday, we met here and we had a knockdown, drag out, hair pulling, biting fight right here in the middle of the sanctuary. And this just really turned us around. Well, I felt like <laughs> we did something. <laughs> but we were also in another church one time that. That aisle should have been three miles wide. And there was people sitting on each side that just, and when we left, it was still like that. <laughs> yeah, but you could just feel it. We have sat in congregations where we hear someone giving a commentary of each person that comes in about their clothes, their kids, and you know what they did this week, and on and on and on. Huh. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was reading one of my notes. Can I read it here? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait till later to do this. I'm just going gonna, gonna to throw this out to you. Then we'll, we'll talk about it in a few moments here. Someone asked me to come and sit in their Sabbath school class. They said, boy, we have some of the most knocked down, drag out arguments you ever heard in your life. Did you know the Bible says that if you are an arguer, you will not be in the kingdom? And we'll read that in just a few moments here. It is in the Bible. And I don't usually use people's names and I don't mean to be embarrassing anybody, but you know, Sandra and I, have, we're, we're in the process of helping the Kokomo church start a new church in Hobbs, little town of Hobbs, Indiana. And so to do this, we had to move our membership from Cicero to Kokomo, and uh, it's a long story. But when we go to Kokomo, excuse me, my nose is running, my allergies is getting out of my hand here. I think, uh, when we go to Kokomo, I tell you, if Ralph isn't standing at the door greeting, I just feel like I haven't had Sabbath. Ralph is a jewel. He doesn't wear a tie. In fact, I've heard people complain about that. He doesn't wear a tie. <laughs> and... <laughs> And he, he'll take he'll take the uh, he'll take the bulletin. I don't know where my bulletin is now, but anyway, he'll take it. He'll take the bulletin, and hand it to you, and he says, "Here's the menu for this morning." I love that. <laughs> and then he'll give me a hug. And uh, he, he gives he gives Sandra a hug, but he's. It's just always a warm feeling. We need more Ralphs. And I don't usually talk about people's names when I'm in the church where they're at, but because I don't know how some of you might think about Judy. <laughs> but she sends us a card every once in a while when something special going on. I see heads going like this. The only thing is, she sent us one on her 60th anniversary, I think it was, and that did, I don't, I don't know if I like that or not. <laughs> but we, we need more Ralphs and Judy's. My challenge to you today is, now don't do this at church, or just do it at church. Don't just be nice to people at church. Here's what I mean. I'm going to repeat some things here I think I've probably mentioned when I've been here before. And here again, I'm going to reinforce what I've said. This is not tooting our horn. Not at all. But you know, when Sondra and I, you know, we traveled for how many years, 45 years or so, and sang in all over the country and Canada and whatever. But it got to the place where it was just getting too much. So we were wondering, what in the world could we do for God? And if you ever ask, what can I do for God? Get on your knees and pray. And then you better get ready. Because God will send you all kinds of things. In fact, I like what uh, Professor Kidder at Andrews University and Seminary says. He says, when God sends you these things into your life, these people into your life, he, he, he says, I like to call them divine appointments. I 
I don't know why I wrote this down here because you're going to laugh when I tell you what it says. It says, believe it or not, I'm usually very quiet and almost bashful. So you'll wonder why I do some of the things I do now. <laughs> but God showed me and Sandra that there was a lot to be done just loving people. And uh, you know, there was a couple that we'd known for years, but uh, they, were, they lived in Carmel. We lived up north of the academy. And uh, you know, round trip, probably 50 miles, I don't know, to where they lived. And they were, we went there about three times a week for two or three years, helping them get their meds and their groceries and, and helping see after them and everything. God placed that. They passed away. Another couple that he's placed in our paths. And uh, we helped them get to their appointments, their doctor's appointments and things and, and all that. But there are other things too. I, I like what, uh, I heard a minister say this, and I don't know who it was, but I wrote it down here. This world is not my home. It's my assignment. Think about that. Just love people. Now, I'm going to tell you, I think I already told you this one story about our neighbors, their Jehovah's Witness, who live right across the street from us. And when we... Uh, when we moved into this place, we were told that they'd never speak to us. And they don't like anybody. They don't like you. They don't like, they just, they don't like people. And so uh, that's a challenge. So as I was building our, adding out to our place, I was putting on a new garage, and, and I was way up in the peak of the garage and putting on siding on the garage up on a ladder. I was in, about 15 years ago. I was a little bit younger then. But uh, this couple had motorcycles and they had them out there and they was washing them all up and everything. John just making them shine. And, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, Sandy got on her motorcycle and started the thing up. And it just, I don't know why it hit me. It just hit me. And like I said, I'm, I'm usually a pretty quiet person. But I turned around and I started, and I'd never had to talk to these people, really, because I, I realized they don't like to talk to people. So I turned around on my ladder and started hollering, Hey! Hey! I don't know how many times I did that, and finally Howard looked up and he says, Oh, well, no, Sandy did. Sandy looked up first. She says, What do you want? I mean, just like that, like that. What do you want? I said, Howard, I says, why do you let her start that motorcycle up when I'm up on this ladder? And they looked at me, and Sandy says, you're crazy. And then they both started laughing. And, and we've been dear, dear friends ever since. <laughs> and Howard and I just, we have a good time together, and we do stuff for each other, and we just... And he confides in me things that he didn't like about the Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> he, he told me just the other day, he says, no, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. But he goes with his wife to church all the time, or meeting, they call it. And, uh, but anyway. But it broke the ice. It just broke the ice. And, and now they're, they're the best neighbors you could ever imagine. And I could just go on and on. I'm going to run you way out, way past lunchtime here. But, but some other things that we did, we started, I know all of you go to Walmart occasionally. I, I heard some laughs. They think at Walmart and Noblesville, they think we live there. But uh, in fact, better by their noses now. <laughs> and it's a big Walmart. <laughs> And, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we've had so much fun there. Sadness, too. And I have a hard time getting telling you about this one. But uh, little Sandy was there, and she would stand at the door. She was a greeter. And she would stand at the door like this. 
You come, walk, you come walking in the door and she'd never raise her head. Never, she wouldn't say anything. So we got to where we would walk up to her and say, hi Sandy, good to see you. Never, no response. So after a while, we came in one day and her head came up and she looked at Sandra and just smiled. I'm like, wow. And it wasn't long till she was saying, Merry Christmas, you know, poor little Sandy. It just, it just brightened my day to see her. Then we didn't see her for a while and we found out that she had passed away. But just love somebody. Look for things. Open your eyes. Look for ways to be loving. There's so much work to do. You know, I, we were in line one time going through the checkout line, and, and there was a lady two, two ahead of us, and she got so embarrassed. She says, everything, <laughs> she had a whole lot of groceries. I think they must have been shopping for a, six months at a time or something like that, an elderly lady. It's funny to say elderly when I'm elderly. But anyway, <laughs> but uh, all of a sudden, she, I heard her say, this is embarrassing. This is just so embarrassing. And uh, so I, I started listening, and I found out that what she had gotten came to $100 exactly. And she had a $100 bill. And she said, uh, no, I'm saying that wrong. What, what she got had come to $106. And she had a $100 bill. And she said, well, I've got a, I've, this is embarrassing. She just, and so I just stepped around the one in front of us and I, I uh, gave him $6. And she's, no, no, you can't do that. No, you sure I can. <laughs> yes, I can. And so we went ahead. She went out through line and we went through line and everything. And so as we were leaving the store, Walking out the door, somebody grabbed me by the arm, and it was her. And she'd went and found her husband somewhere. I don't know how she said that's what it was. <laughs> anyway, anyway, she handed me six dollars back. And I said, You don't need to do this, you know. And she she put her head on my chest and just sobbed. And she said, No one. I, I get emotional because she said no one has ever done this for me anything like this it's all out there if you just look there's a guy at the Myers store up there that he, his job is to he always looks like he just fell off a garbage truck <laughs> And he, he gets the, he's, he's the guy that brings the car to him. <laughs> and <laughs> he came running over a while back, and he said, there's a guy tried to run over me out there. <laughs> and I said, well, why? He said, I don't, he's just mean, I guess. And he, says, and he said, uh, but he yelled at me. He said, uh, get out of my way. He said, I haven't got time to fool with you. And, and uh, he said, what do, you, what do you do to somebody like that? I said, well, you just, just love him, just love him. And uh, he said, oh, I did, I did say to him, you know, I'm the guy that puts the cart in there so you can push your groceries back out in it. <laughs> but, uh, but now he, he t Sandra rides a little electric scooter we got for her that she rides around in the store and stuff. And, and uh, David, David got himself a little, uh, I don't know, I guess it's just a motor scooter. I think I don't. I guess it's a gasoline one. I think it is, John. I think it's. I don't think it's electric. But anyway, he kids her all the time about it. He wants to race with her now and stuff. And and so we've, we've we've become good friends. But I've noticed that when we when we're joking with him and having fun with him, as people look at us like you're crazy, you know. What what do you fool somebody like that for? But I I I, I don't I, I I could just go on and on and on. I guess I better. Uh, go on with my sermon here, but uh, 
because there's just so much that you can do just to make people feel wanted and loved and, and uh, that they're somebody. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> we, have, we have a neighbor now that lived right across the street from us. They haven't been there too long. And uh, well, I guess they've been there about a year, a little over. Her husband is very, very ill with Alzheimer's. He doesn't even know where he's at. And she's trying to take care of him and everything. And her yard grows up, and they don't have much money and everything. So I'm... Uh, I, I'm, I'm mowing their yard. I'm not bragging about it. She said, I can't pay you. And I says, who asked you for pay? I mow your yard. Looks nice. And uh, so she, she just, <laughs> then she sends a kid and her, her grandkids over with food sometimes, uh, wanting to give us something in return. And lots of times we, it's pork and stuff, but... <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I don't know how many times we've told them uh, about the way we eat, but it doesn't make, seem to make much difference. But anyway, I'm kind of kind of rambling here a minute, but uh, I, ju I just want you to just, just love people. Just love them. And, uh, you know, the Methodist Church, Saunders played for the Methodist Church and Cicero there for 32 years, and, and you know, they just think that she's the greatest thing in the world. And uh, she's, on the, she's on the committees and stuff there, and she's in the yearbook and everything. I don't know what all it is, and everybody thinks she's a Methodist, I think. But, uh, but, anyway. <laughs> but there's just so much work to do. Oh, and this, this, the black fellow, I got I to gotta tell you about Leonard at Walmart. And I got to tell you about him, then I'll go on. He was so loud. He's a greeter. And he gets so loud, he used to, that he would just make so much noise that the cashiers and everybody were just upset about him. They'd just fuss about him. Well, we got acquainted with Leonard. And uh, <laughs> and so we we got to talking to him, and, and I got to talking to the to the cashiers. I said, you know, he's not such a bad guy. He's all right. You know, he's he's just having fun. And uh, so then we found out that uh, he's a black guy, and he's married to a white lady, and she's got a good job and everything, and uh, you know, and she he brags about her, and you know, and he says, I want you to meet her. So one day we went in there, and there she was. And he brought her around and, uh, and, uh, and uh, introduced us, you know. And then he took off and was doing his job. And we stood and visited with her for a while. And, and uh, then we found out where he lives. And in his spare time, he splits wood and sells it to campground and stuff there. And it just, it's just, but I'm, I'm going around the barn twice to get to the house here. But, uh, but uh, the other day, not, not long ago, he was talking to another black couple in there. And, uh, and as we were walking past him, I didn't want to interrupt him, so I just patted him on the back and I said, good to see you, Leonard. I'll never forget what he said to these people. Because it, 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 it really, I don't know, it hit me. He said, that's my buddy. He told this, this couple, this black couple, he, he pointed at me and he said, that's my buddy. He knows where I live. What are you doing? What are you doing to spread God's love? Open your eyes. Open your hearts. And do God's work. I pray that we haven't lost our first love. Look for ways to be loving. Look for things to do. Okay, I better wind up here. <laughs> Sondra get 
I don't know. I, I, I don't look at Sandra lots of times when I'm speaking because I, I know I sometimes I think she thinks I should maybe be quiet <laughs> about some things. I just had to scribble another note down here, and I've had it in this set of notes for a while, but. Are you really looking for, to help someone, to love them? And the reason I'm saying this, in the trailer park where our daughter, our invalid daughter, our oldest daughter is an invalid, she lives there. About a thousand feet or so, I guess, from her trailer is a, is a Seventh-day Adventist deacon in another church from where we go. I even heard here a while back that he claims he's a prophet. And right beside our daughter lives a former Seventh-day Adventist who has cancer. Or he has had, I think he's beat it now, but, but he's, uh, for a while anyway, but he's in terrible shape. But we have mentioned about mowing the lawns and stuff. You think this Seventh-day Adventist deacon will mow a lawn? He's above that. He won't even mow his own lawn. He makes his wife do it. But he's a prophet. I just wonder where people are thinking and what they're thinking. Okay, I'll get off my bandwagon again here. I'm, I said I was going to show you something. Turn to Galatians 5. I'm going to be reading this from the, uh, I have to look and see what it is. It's the Life Application Study Bible. And uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a translation. And I've talked to several ministers about this Bible, and they say it's as accurate as any Bible are going just about right now. But I like the way it reads. When you follow, oh, I didn't tell you where it's at, Galatians 5. You know where I'm going here, though. Verse 19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, your lives will produce these evil results. Now, this makes it very plain because this is modern English here. Sexual immorality, impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, Participation in demonic activities, hostility, and I think most of your Bibles will, will I don't know what the King James, what's this King James say? Uh, variance. You know what that variance is? That is arguing. If you look it up in the, if you look that up in the Greek, you'll find it's talking about people who argue. And, uh, but anyway, but people who are, have uh, demonic activities, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, divisions, the feeling that everyone is wrong except those in your own little group, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other kinds of sin. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's just about as plain as you can get. But you see what, well, you read that and you, you kind of get all tense and everything, but then you read the next verse down there. Those who belong, no, but when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce the kind of fruit in us. Love, doesn't that make you feel good? The very first one it mentions is love, joy. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Here there is no conflict with the law. Doesn't that make you just feel like a warm fuzzy when you read those? I know I fall flat on my face many times with some of these things because I'm not patient sometimes. <laughs> and... <laughs> Uh, 
and all these things. But God is gracious. Okay, and we're going to turn to some very familiar texts here just real quickly. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, you know what that is. The love chapter. First Corinthians 13, if I could speak in any language in heaven or earth, but didn't love others, I would only be making meaningless noise like a loud gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I knew all the mysteries of the future and knew everything about everything, but didn't love others, what good would I be? And if I had the gift of faith so that I could speak to a mountain and make it move, without love I could, would be no good to anybody. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would be of no value whatsoever. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable and it keeps no record of when it has been wronged. It is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never, uh, excuse me. Love never gives up, never loses faith is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Love will last forever, but prophecy and speaking in unknown tongues and special knowledge will all disappear. Now we know only a little, and even the gift of prophecy reveals little, but when the end comes, these special gifts will all disappear. It's like this, when I was a child, I spoke and, I, and thought and reasoned as a child does. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we say things imperfectly, as in a poor mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me now. There are three things that will endure, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Uh, let's let's turn to well now yeah, okay let's let's turn to Second Timothy three. You know what this is all about too. Second Timothy three verses one through five. You should also know this, Timothy. That in the last days there will be very difficult times where people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Boy, do we see that in the world today. My, my, my. Of all the things that you see going on in the news today, how often do you hear the word of God mentioned? In fact, if you, if you mention it, you better watch out. You probably end up in jail. There will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and have no interest in what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act as if they are religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. You must stay away from people like that. Hmm. Okay, and let's, let's turn on to uh, Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verses 34, starting with verse 34. Matthew 25, starting verse 34. Then the king will say to those on the... I'm having a hard time saying this. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. 
I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in the prison and visit you? And the king will tell them, I assure you, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you're doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into eternal into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me no clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hunger or thirsty or a stranger or naked or a sick person or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I assure you, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. One more text we turn to, Matthew 5. You all know what this is about. Matthew 5, starting in verse 1. One day as the crowds were gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside with his disciples and sat down to teach them. And this is what he taught them. God blesses those who realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is given to them. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are gentle and lowly, for the whole earth will belong to them. God blesses those who are hungry and thirsty for justice, for they will receive it in full. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those who, whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Bless, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted because they live for God, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when you are mocked and persecuted and lied about because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient pro prophets were persecuted too. Now, verse 13 you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Remember what we read to begin with in Revelation? God says, I have something against you. You've lost your first love. See what this says right here? You're the salt of the earth. What good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it useful again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a mountain, glowing in the night for all to see. Don't hide your light under a basket. Instead, put it on a stand and let it shine for all. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. What are you going to do? Disappointments, frustrations, interruptions are often God's way of saying, one of my children needs you just now. Think about that. God is directing you. One of my children, he says, needs you. I lost my bullets and I can't remember the three three nineteenth our closing song. <laughs> 